I'm going to go ahead and welcome out our first guests, um, Danny Deal of Band Lab and Daniel Rowland of Lander and other amazing uh, companies. Come on up. Hey, y'all. Hi. We got more, than, more mics than we need. We do. Um, we just saw each other just a few weeks ago now in South by Southwest. So um, we're going to be talking a lot about what's going on uh, in the world of AI and music creation and distribution. Um, but first, I'd like to let our panelists introduce themselves. Wow. Hi, my name is Danny Deal. I'm currently the head of communications and creator insights at BandLab. Do we have any BandLab users here? OK, a couple. Nice. And I'm also a DJ, and I'm a music producer, and I'm also currently the president of the Chicago chapter for the Recording Academy. So I wear a lot of hats. And primarily, I'm very interested in helping up and coming creators, new creators, indie creators help to uh, get their footing and find the path that best, best suits them, whatever that looks like. Yeah, so I'm Daniel Roland. I, I wear multiple hats as well. So I am, let's see, I'm a college professor, is one thing I've been doing for about 15 years, teaching music production. Um, and the, I come from the creative side of the music industry, kind of like Danny does. Uh, is a mostly as a music producer, producer and a mixing and mastering engineer. So I work on a lot of things like John Wick, the new movie that just came out, Star Wars stuff, uh, the you know Gale track that blew up last year, Gucci Mane, a lot of different things, usually across hip hop and film and television. And lastly, I am one of the heads of Lander, which is a company some of you may know based out of Montreal. It's an AI mastering company that now does plugins and collaboration. And similar to what Danny said, our kind of mission is to support up and coming creators, right? And kind of provide people with an on-ramp into what can be a fairly complicated terrain of tools and services for music creation. Uh, yeah, and that's me. So I bring up South by Southwest in part because I don't know how you all felt, but this year it felt like AI was in and through every session, almost every conversation. Do you, how do, from your vantage point in your industry spaces, where are you seeing that reflected right now? Yeah, sure. I mean, so, you know, it's maybe, well, I guess both of our companies are, have been involved in AI for a while. Lander's been in it for about 10, almost 10 years now, so before it was cool. Um, but, yeah, now it's just insane. I mean, I think my cereal this morning said made with AI or something on it. Like, everybody is trying to get into the space or, you know, have it be part of what they're doing, kind of like Web3 was, you know, like a year or two ago. So it, we're in a bit of a, of a, a big hype cycle around this right now. Um, but like anything, that's going to settle, and there's a lot of the things that we'll talk about today, I'm sure, will kind of be integrated into some of the technology that we all use and are, are comfortable with, on the music side of things at least. But, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, a company pops up every 10 minutes, I think, that's a new AI startup. Yeah, the interesting thing in particular about AI compared to some newer technologies such as Web3 or blockchain is that it has been around for decades. It's been around for much longer than a lot of people know or realize or expect when it, that fact is brought up. Um, it's only really become at the forefront of the conversation because of the popularization of tools like ChatGPT that have made it accessible to everyone. So back in 2018, 2019, when I was writing about AI for The Verge, I actually found that copyright documents within the government had mentioned that this was something that we should be worried about over 50 years ago. So this is something that's been around, but it's really only at the, at the table because everyone now has access to these tools and everyone is able to interact with them and to see how it can affect their everyday life. I feel like I kind of stumbled into AI inadvertently at South by Southwest in 2016. IBM was there doing a demonstration of their AI tools very simply through Reaper. And it allowed me to, on a keyboard, play a series of chords. And then it began shaping wholesale the, the genre. Uh, sad, happy, hip hop, country. And it was just, and it was working with me. And it was very rudimentary. I mean, I think about the sound, it's a seven-year-old technology, but like, even then I'm like, this is going to change everything once it really starts maturing and developing. So like starting with BandLab, what are the tools that you see that artists can use in your space that are really helping to encourage creativity right now? 
Very specifically, BandLab has an AI tool that's called Song Starter. It's a tool that is meant to, well, there's a reason why it's called Song Starter and not Song Finisher. It's, a, it's a, an idea machine. So you can go to Song Starter and you can input anything from lyrics to an audio description. You could even throw emojis into it, whatever you want. And then it will give you three options that you can then import directly into studio and work off of. Um, I think really importantly, the way Song Starter is built is that there's a lot of rules and guidelines uh, around the AI. We think it's really important to exalt the human in the process and not the algorithm. So our AI is trained on uh, material that we pay for. Um, it's not trained on anything that's out in the public domain. It's not trained on any copyrighted material. It's truly meant to be something that you can just take a few bars of MIDI, you can change the BPM, you can chop it up, you can assign new, uh, new sounds to it, import uh, your own sounds, assign plugins, and really, truly make it come to life and have it be your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's, we're in a bit of a weird period right now when it comes to AI, where we have tools like BandLab, which are like great entry points for people into making music that have AI enabled. And we have kind of standalone other products or things like ChatGPT or whatever that where AI is involved. And on the music side, there's a number of music apps where you can go press a few buttons and generate something, right? Mm -hmm. But what we haven't really seen is that integrated into the professional tools. It's in Photoshop, right? It's in other, you know... Um, media tools, but it's not really in DAWs so much yet, right? We see plug-in companies that are kind of doing that, so you can kind of add in some of that intelligence, but it hasn't as yet kind of made its way into the dinosaur uh, technology that a lot of us use to make music. And when do you think that's going to start changing? I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> just not released yet. Yeah. yeah, people are actively, of course, aggressively working on how to make this work properly, but there's a lot of concerns, you know? You can't yeah. just launch something out there without really understanding some of the ethical considerations and data sets and repercussions, especially if you're a company that's doing really well already mm -hmm. with what you have. You don't want to miss the boat on something, but you don't want to jump in too early as well. Yeah. yeah, and beyond the ethical considerations, there's the fact that pretty much all of this is unlitigated as of yet. So it's really, really risky for companies to take these steps, and it's much easier for individuals and creators to experiment with the tools that are out there. And then yeah. the companies will buy those other smaller companies. and then yeah. That's right, that's right. And I mean, to your point, like, I mean, Microsoft, Adobe, like, it seems like everybody's now unleashing this suite of AI and power tools. But I want to go back to this thing about um, the copyright consideration. So, so the two of you were on a panel, and this came at South by, and this came up where um, I can't remember who said it, but basically that like if there's input from a label, anything that's copyrighted, like the labels and the publishers have a stake in that. It's protected, right? But I'm more curious about taking the song creator aspect of like so if AI is helping you to generate something, where is that line then if it's, if it's an assistive tool rather than a generative tool from pre-existing content? Do you mean what is the line with what makes it a human-created asset versus yeah. an AI asset? That's right. That's really difficult to say. So within copyright law, they basically say in order for you to be able to copyright something, there needs to be uh, basically a modicum of human creativity that you've added to the work. And we've seen that completely human created works are sometimes not even eligible for copyright. So if you took a track and you split it up into stems and you tried to copyright maybe the drums, for example, that probably wouldn't even be uh, eligible for copyright. It wouldn't show that it was inventive enough or new enough for you to get a copyright specifically for those sounds. So uh, we're talking about su a subjective line here, and it's really difficult to, to say what that line is. I think, um, you know, ultimately it is uh, up to all of us to decide, and maybe sometimes the courts in the future. Well, like you said, a lot of this has yet to be litigated, right? Every case that comes out is a big deal right now mm -hmm. that involves AI because a lot of it's never really, you know, these are bridges we never really crossed before. Right. Yeah. Danny, do you want to reflect on the, what we were talking about earlier about the case involving Midjourney and the graphic novel? Yeah. So for anyone who hasn't heard, there was recently a really important case that the Copyright Office ruled on. There was an author who had requested copyright for a comic book. It was a, a visual novel, so she had written, uh, written the comic, and then there were images as well. And the Copyright Office recently revoked 
partial copyright on it because she had failed to disclose that she had used Midjourney to generate the images. So the Copyright Office said, you can have a copyright for the portion that you wrote and for the way that you arrange the images, but the images themselves you cannot get a copyright for because you didn't create it. It would essentially be the same as if you hired an artist to paint a portrait of you and you gave them direction on how to paint the portrait, but you didn't create that portrait yourself. And so very recently, the Copyright Office issued an update of policy that was a formalization of that letter to basically say that AI created works on their own without human intervention are not eligible for copyright. And that's really, I, I should say, in the now, but that could always be adjusted in the future. And so, and Daniel, let me put it to you. So in your workflow, whether it's, of course, Lander and Mastering, which is already, like, it's funny, like, I feel like uh, with AI and that, it used to get kicked around a lot in, like, music production circles quite a bit. I'm sure it's still, it still does, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to your point, like, now AI has become such a, an accepted, like, uh, we're in this growth cycle where it's not abnormal to, to think about that. But for you, where do you see your tool sets changing as this, technology starts to grow. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, I, I got used to being the, the audio engineer that kind of crossed the line over into the AI space and people were very angry with me for a long time for doing that, right? So like, you know, seven, eight years ago, being the person who was out speaking about AI when, you know, we were kind of taking mastering, which was this thing people didn't really know what it was and combining it with AI, it was like sacrilege, you know, to do that in the music production space because it hadn't really ever been done. Um, so, you know, as this stuff has become more popular, it's taken less pressure off me, which is great. But, um, but yeah, so like, so it's a lot of, in the music industry, the first real productized things that had AI were around mastering and mixing and things like that, right? Mastering became kind of an easier target to shoot at, um, though people were upset about it, right? Because they thought, like a lot of things with AI was going to take their jobs away, it was, we were going to automate the human out of the, you know, which it's been 10 years, that never happened, right? It just kind of allowed more people to kind of play around with music production, right? And kind of figure out if they were interested in it or not, and it kind of lowered that barrier to entry, and we saw a lot more people making music. So it wasn't a bad thing, ultimately. Though that doesn't mean it's always not a bad thing. So, but yeah, so I mean, I, I got into it on that angle, and then I've always used, because of, I've worked with a lot of bands, um, like a guy named Adrian Ballou, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, artists like that, that really exposed me to kind of generative types of com composition, right? Or, you know, accidental things, or, you know, uh, randomizers and all that kind of stuff. And AI is just kind of a more evolved version of that. If you think about stuff that David Bowie and Brian, you know, you know and all these artists we really respect have been using for a long time to help augment their creative abilities, right? So, and their palette, which I think is what the big thing AI is good for. So, so yeah, I mean, I use it now for all sorts of stuff. I mean, besides the chat GPT side of things for music, there's some really good AI composition assistants that you, you know, you feed, you can hit a button and have it generate something if you want that you then iterate on, or you can feed your own music into it um, and kind of go back and forth as you kind of move on to something that you, is still a part of, you know, what you created, but takes it into a, a place that you may, it wouldn't have gone, just like working with another composer or with a collaborator. So anyway, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there right now. So I'm curious to get your takes on the amount of content that we're gonna start seeing hitting the marketplace. So like, I've heard this number de debunked that's maybe a little lower, but it, it kind of doesn't matter. So let's call it a range of 50 to 100,000 songs a day are being uploaded. Yeah. And only 4% of those are from major labels. So we've got all this content that's out there. And now, to your point, and if you look at, um, I mean, Google won't even release their text to music model because of the copyright issues, right? Mm -hmm. But once that starts entering the mainstream, how do you, well, one, how do we navigate as a consumer or as a fan the music that we want? And then how do artists, do you think, navigate that people are trying to find and connect with? That's a great question. Great yeah. question. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You know, part of the, yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter the number of tracks uploaded to Spotify. Once it gets beyond X tens of thousands, it's like it might as well be 10 million, right? You're, all, you're awash in a sea of music that you can never listen to, right? So that's already a problem. I think my concern, and if it's people making music, you know, that's fine. If it's just AI-generated content that's being uploaded to 
you know, to try to eke out a little bit of money from a Spotify playlist, which if you listen to a lot of the functional music that's on Spotify, like the meditation style music, some of the low down tempo lo-fi stuff is AI generated because that's something that AI can actually do pretty well right now, whereas it can't really make a pop song that sounds very good at the moment, right? So you see this influx of all of that and you have no way of knowing what's what, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's a challenge. And then you look at services like Tidal, which ban all AI compositions from being uploaded, right? That's, that's part of their terms of service is you can't generate something with AI and put it on there because they're trying to kind of keep a more curated experience. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna see more of that, to be totally honest with you, mm -hmm. um, where we're still gonna have the major streaming players, right? Because everyone wants the all you can eat thing, but we're gonna have, I think, more boutique and whether that's a Web3 thing or not, um, places where you can, kind of like people used to treat record labels, right? I used to have my favorite record label as a kid and I would go after, I, I looked at them as the tastemaker that would help expose me to new music, kind of the way that people look at playlists nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I think that type of stuff is gonna become increasingly more important and we'll see more businesses kind of built on the back of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with you in that um, <laughs> it might as well be 10 million. Once it, it, it really is about 100,000 tracks that are uploaded every day. At this point, the majority of them don't even get a single play at all. And adding more music to the mix is not going to change that ratio. At this point, I think we need to have more integrations with incoming tech companies and the incumbents to figure out better ways for artists to build community, to monetize, to be able to build their own platforms and enrich the ways that they can give back to their fan base. Um, ultimately, no matter how much AI music is out there, the people that are going to win are the people that are going to build a human connection with their audience. That is always going to be the thing that puts you across the finish line at the end of the day. So what tools do you think are going to come into shape to help create that artist to fan connection? Because I totally agree, like, just thinking about that, uh, is it Illuminate study this last week? It's like 42% of songs on streaming services, like 10 plays or less. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just like an, an obscene amount of, of songs. But, so where, how do you think that artists navigate that to make that connection? Well, I mean, it's interesting. It's one of the downsides or repercussions from the democratization of music technology, right, is the fact that everyone can make music now, basically, and it doesn't cost 50 grand to build a studio or 100 grand to build a studio, which we love that story, right? The downside is there's going to be more music, you know, good and bad, whatever, you know, however you define that that's being created. So that's tough. I mean, there's, as far as what artists can do, I mean, there's, you know, the Web3 thing is controversial, right? But there's definitely some companies, even companies here, that are in that space that are really, regardless of whether you believe in the blockchain side of things, I like what their story is, which is we're here to help independent artists create a direct relationship with their fan base and monetize that in new and interesting ways, right? So I think that, we're, you know, regardless of the mechanism for that is really important. And for artists, I think, you know, we're, I think we all understand at this point, you can't just release a song and expect to be successful, right? That's, that's the odds of that are extremely, extremely low. So being creative with what you do, I mean, I'm somebody who's, you know, over the past six months gotten really big into the esports space and the competitive gaming space, bridging music into that space, right? That's an area that not a lot of artists are playing in, but there's a lot of money and there's a lot of eyes and ears mm -hmm. in that space. So starting to think more creatively about, you know, where your music's being placed, the fan base you're going after, that type of thing, I think is, is helpful as well. Mm -hmm. So let's jump over to what's starting to happen in terms of generative AI for, let's say, voices, right? Mm -hmm. So, has anybody out there heard the Jay-Z verse that was generated with AI? A few of you? Okay. So, that, and I think there's like a, one where Kanye West is singing a country song. That one. There are others. And then, and then they're like performative, like the David Guetta thing where he's, you know, does the Eminem mm -hmm. voice live. Where do you think that starts to spin out in terms of good things in the music world and also problematic things? It's already spun out into problematic things. Yeah. <laughs> the two things that you just mentioned are incredibly problematic. There's a reason why David Guetta said when he shared that video, I'm never releasing this publicly mm -hmm. because he knows that there are already copyright and persona laws that are in place that would make it very easy for Eminem to sue him. So right now with artists experimenting, it's interesting for us to look as bypassers and to be curious about 
what that future looks like. In practice, I think what that actually does look like is artists creating agreements where AI data sets can be trained on their voice and likeness and their catalog, and then every time somebody uses that AI to help them create a song, that artist would then get a royalty payment. Yeah, certainly, that's one avenue for it. I mean, it's, it, it, I was approached maybe three, three and a half years ago uh, from a, by a company who was involved in the speech synthesis space, right? And they were interested, so they were just quickly, were doing uh, post-production for film and television. So the idea that, that, that a company could, if, if you had a movie in English, you could hit a button and then you could generate that with the actor's voices in various languages and things like that. Um, and they had worked on, at the time it was very hush-hush, but they were working on The Mandalorian and they were taking Luke Skywalker's voice when there's a, there's a scene where like Luke Skywalker from the 70s comes into that show and they had actually trained on his old voice from, you know, from dubbing things from the old Star Wars film so it sounded like young Luke Skywalker even though it was older Mark Hamill doing that. But the, what they were interested in is getting in touch with labels because they really wanted to clone Ariana Grande's voice. They really wanted to do these all, all these other things so that in their minds, and I think this is accurate, artists could basically expand the reach of their brand to be in, uh, in apps, to, be, to have more personalized, or the perception of personalized relationships with their fans, even though they obviously can't talk to every, every one of their fans. So they were looking for various ways to do that through virtual avatars, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, which I thought was interesting, and that's kind of what we see coming to fruition, you know, for better or worse. Hatsune Miku, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Seriously, uh, the, how did that take so long to get over here, right? Uh, it's a digital, a virtual idol from Japan, basically, that's been around forever. Mm -hmm. when I, even when I was in Japan 15 years ago, she was everywhere doing stadium shows and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, this is going to come over to the States next week. And it never really did. Mm -hmm. So, Danny, from your vantage point, can you sh maybe share some stories of how you see artists being empowered by Band Lab or with creative tools they find in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all been talking about this phrase for a very long time, the democratization of making music. And frankly, for a long time, it was hogwash. <laughs> it didn't really mean anything, it was a buzzword. And I think we are actually in the era now truly of the democratization of making music because of apps like BandLab, because of services like Lander. Um, and I think that it's really important because Creativity fundamentally is, is a human right. And there are so many people across the world that don't have access to the tools that would allow themselves to discover their creative self. Um, and now we have things like BandLab that are available on Android and iOS and are free and allow people to see if they, they have that portion of their personality that they can spark that creative juice and maybe they could be a musician. And also, what if you just wanted to make music casually but you didn't have aspirations of being a prof professional musician? We've seen that creativity crossover happen already with photos for Instagram, with video for TikTok, but it hasn't happened yet with music. We still put the musician um, in an exalted position on a pedestal and making music casually as a hobby is, um, is still not as, as proudly looked upon. Mm -hmm. But I think we're getting to a space now where, um, where everybody can feel like they have a voice and they have a space and they have the ability to, um, to do something with it. Um, yeah, we have a really, ex actually, this is a, a really exciting story that came out of BandLab that's actually a really great example of that is an artist named David, D4VD. And last year, he didn't even know how to make music. He was a Fortnite gamer, and he wanted to make music because he was getting copyright strikes on his videos that he was putting up. So he discovered BandLab, figured out how to make some tracks, and literally within four to five months, got a major label deal. And he's now on a headline tour uh, with 31.5, it's probably more at this point, million followers on Spotify. And his track, his lead track that he made on BandLab has twice the listens of Beyonce's Break My Soul. And this is truly amazing because this is someone who had no aspirations of being a professional musician and wound up finding something that he was inadvertently very good at. Yeah, and I think that's, that part's interesting because it's easy 
as somebody, okay, so I went to school for music and music production for seven years, and I struggled, and I learned all the stuff, right? So, and I deal, you know, with a lot of people who are, you know, professionals in the industry, right? And I, I come from that space, and that, those are the people that were angry with me when I kind of went out with Lander. But you can, it's easy to take the mindset of, no, if you want to make music, you should learn how to play the piano, right? You should learn music theory. You should blah, 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 right? And I, I get that to some degree, but when... The, the average kid has access to so many different ways to be creative where the barrier has been dropped through Instagram, through through freaking Minecraft and Roblox, right? Like music, you know, and it is not necessarily at the top of that list if we can continue to set a bar that's so high that, you know, kids can at least engage with it and get a vibe on if they're talented or if they want to pursue that or if they just want to mess around and make music socially with their friends, you know? So I think facilitating that in a way that doesn't destroy the music industry, right? So we need smart people shepherding those tools. But I think it's really important, so. I'm curious, Daniel, what, what your take is. So the mastering space clearly is there, but in the mixing space, where do you see that starting to change through AI in the next <clears throat> yeah, year so, or two? Uh, so Lander started as an automated mixing company and, um, and pivoted to mastering for a number of reasons. One is it was just easier to do. There's so many variables that go into mixing. You know, mastering definitely too, but mixing is a whole other level. I, you know, there were, I was talking to some of the major DAW manufacturers, the digital audio workstations, like, you know, Pro Tools and Ableton that we all use to make music with, five, six years ago about adding some of our, you know, dormant IP into their, their t software. Everyone's been looking at this for a long time, but I'm just, it's another one of those things. There are some automated mixing services out there, 100%. It's just not actually made its way into the technology that everyone traditionally has used. And when it does, there'll be a whole big uproar because people will be pissed off about it. And then they'll chill out in a few years and realize that it, you know, it's not a big deal. But um, yeah, there hasn't been a ton. I mean, Isotope obviously has done some stuff in that space. There's a company called Roex, R-O-E-X, that has an automated mixing system. But so far, you know, there's still a lot of effort that you have to put in to get something good out of that. So it hasn't really kind of met the creator that needs that type of technology where they are at this point. But I mean, give it a couple of years, you know? Yeah. Just to veer off a little bit tangentially, post-production audio for film and television, do you think this completely changes the process of ADR and translation? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's already... I get hit up by more companies to consult, and that's not even my space necessarily, right? But ask to consult on that where, yeah, I mean, because the amount of money that's spent on that, if you think of the scale of content that's out there right now, if you can automate, I mean, there's, we're not even just talking about, you know, being able to automate, you know, dial translation into various languages, right? Even automating the lips in the actual video to move to now look like they're saying those words, right? To be able to do that type of stuff and automate that entire workflow is a huge, it exists right now. But um, yeah, we're gonna continue to see that scale up and there's a lot of money in that industry so there's a lot of money that's willing to be invested in that type of technology to see it come to fruition because there's a direct financial, you know, yeah. gain from that. Yeah, so from your vantage points, let's start with opportunities for creatives. Like, as you look out over the next year or so, where do you see the space really opening up uh, for AI tech, AI tools to empower this generation of creatives that's coming forward? Well, I think we touched on some of that already. I think the AI tools that currently exist already do empower the next generation of musicians um, in ways that we didn't even see five years ago, uh, even when I was coming up and getting into music production. I was in the SoundCloud era and I was doing bootlegs and remixes and trying to grab uh, very low quality MP3s and separate stems. Um, and everything would have been so much easier now if I had the access to the tools that are available um, on platforms like BandLab. Um, I also didn't come from a traditional music theory background. I, I did take piano lessons, but I did not take music theory in school. And I battled my entire creative career with people telling me that I was not a real musician because I was using samples, because I didn't have a theory background, because I wasn't using a keyboard to write out my melodies and I was drawing them in the piano roll. And we still get some backlash like that, but at least now it's more acceptable and it's only going to continue to become more acceptable for everyone to be able to create in whatever way is the easiest for them, is the most accessible to them, and makes the most sense to them. Yeah, I mean, and it's, 
there's such a wide breadth of AI tools out there. I think all, oftentimes we kind of default to thinking about AI composition stuff, right? Something that's writing music. When there's AI to help you, I mean, look at Lander and Splice and companies like that where you can go, if you, you know, if you find a sample that you like, you can have it kind of curate other samples that will go with that. It's not stuff that you wouldn't have just found on your own, but it might have taken you a long time to sift through thousands of samples to find these things. So it, the, just the assistance in curation is a huge time saver and may expose you to things that you wouldn't have thought to pair with other things, right? Mm -hmm. So that type of stuff is cool. The source separation stuff has gotten, and I, I talked about this at South by Southwest, I use it every single day. Um, companies like Audio Shake and Moises, if some of you know that, so it's great if you're a musician and you just want to practice music, right, and you want to remove the guitar part from your favorite song and either learn it and or insert your guitar part in place of that. It's great for people who are doing mixing and mastering, honestly, like it lets us pull apart songs and, and remix them in Atmos and do all the stuff that was literally impossible even a few years ago because it's not that source separation didn't exist, it just didn't sound very good, right? So ju that's just like with the, the music side, that stuff is just continually improving and improving. Yeah, yeah I think that there are two aspects that you named that are really crucial for creators now in terms of how AI is applicable to their workflow and that is surprise and saving time. Those are the two places where AI is supremely good at working with humans. And it can be in really boring ways too. Uh, AI can be used to clean up room tone, for example, if you have a recording that's not so great. Um, and that's something that you probably wouldn't want to spend your time on, right? You'd like to just get to the recording and get to the more creative part. So let AI do the boring stuff for you. And then also when it comes to, you touched on this, the surprise portion of things, AI might help you make some choices that could inspire you in ways that you would have never arrived to on your own. Yeah, and the boring stuff is important. There's a lot of, you know, depending on, I don't know, how we should have, I should have asked at the beginning of this, how many people are artists or music producers are aspiring in that area. Okay, so a fair number, right? Like, as you start to do that as a career, there are absolutely tasks, not just the paperwork kind of stuff that you have to do. I use ChatGPT to automate so much of my paperwork now, literally, I mean, the amount of time I have to spend doing that, just as an engineer, documentation for labels and all this bullshit, honestly, that's important. Mm -hmm. It takes me like a 20th at the time now, because ChatGPT does all that stuff for me, because I just wrote some prompts and I'm not even very smart, right? It's amazing. But the, uh, the you know, other stuff, I and mean, restoration is probably one of my favorite things AI has gotten so much better at, well, Isotope RX and tools like that, where like, I have to go in and, so I spend a lot of time removing pops and clicks and breaths and you know, rumble and all this stuff, right, that, that you can do amazingly with this technology, but to automate some of that stuff, because I'm just doing the same thing over and over and over again, and I don't look at it as a creative endeavor, right? I look at it as something that's a pain in my butt. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of things that I think AI you know, really has a place for most everybody, unless you just really enjoy doing some of that tedious stuff. Because we need, you know, the, the challenge I think a lot of you are gonna face with the growth of a lot of these tools is, if you're not using them, it's okay, but other people are gonna be. And if you're being, if you need to make a living and make money, being more efficient is part of that, right? So it doesn't mean you're removing creativity or something, you don't have to use it that way, but it definitely will help you get more work done to stay competitive in what is already a very competitive field. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's the demarcation line. It's like uh, those that use are using AI tools and those that aren't, and especially like in something like mixing, where time really is money, learning shortcuts, learning process faster, and people that can supercharge that to a 20th in some case. I mean, for that's paperwork, but it, I think the process will start to condense even more and get faster. No, if I could hit a button right now in Pro Tools, and Pro Tools generated me a basic rough mix, that I could then go tweak and make my own. And maybe it was trained upon mixes I had done previously, so it kind of knows, I'd do that in two seconds. Yeah. And even people who complain about it, would they would do that too, right? Because right. it gets you, a lot of people have assistant engineers that do that for them, right? Yeah. So, okay, so it's endangering that gig, I guess. Yeah, but. so that's an interesting analog because like where I've heard people talking about GPT is thinking about as a uh, an assistant. Like you're paying an assistant, think of it, you had a paid assistant that you had six of them on your staff and they're just generating that content for you. But yeah, as an assistant engineer, if you could get to that rough mix in 10 minutes, it really starts to streamline to an individual what they can do. It's interesting, yeah. So um, so what are your, con do you have any concerns or what concerns do you have with AI as it begins to integrate more into the creative process or into the music industry more broadly? 
Yeah, I mean, there are definitely concerns, right? So like with any technology, where we're talking about some of the benefits right here, right now, so it sounds great, but with the pro proliferation of people's ability to, to make music, that sounds good, but it will also be used by companies that would typically hire creators, right? So as an example, if I was, if I was an advertising firm and I needed to create, you know, a uh, 30 second short, right, or a 30 second ad, normally I might hire one of you to compose the music for it, I might go to a production library where you may have provided the music to that production library and been paid. Now, right, there's fairly decent tools that will analyze my 30 second video and compose to that. And I can just keep hitting shuffle until I find the music I like, and I can even denote points in my video that I think the music should pay extra attention to and highlight, and it will do that, right? So in that case, that's a little problematic, right? Where we're kind of, you know, removing um, a stream of revenue for, for musicians, and that is a thing, right? And I think it's gonna affect sync and some other things as well. So, so there are potential downsides, but that's the case with everything. I mean, when drum machines came out, when DAW's digital audio technology came out, right? All of this stuff will make some areas of the industry diminish a little bit and then others will rise. And we, we haven't really seen what that's gonna be necessarily yet because we're such early days, but it'll totally be a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other concerns you would throw in there, Danny, for oh you? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I have so many concerns from a, from a copyright perspective, uh, from a legal perspective. I think it's really important to protect human IP. And I am concerned about the government not responding in a time, not that they've historically ever responded in a timely manner, but <laughs> I am concerned at the rate at which AI is advancing and how slow government historically has been to respond to tech. And tech has always led the way in terms of music, whether it's music creation, music consumption, right? It's always been the predictor for human behavior. And then once it becomes too messy, that's when government steps in. And with AI in part particular, it it is a very special nuisance because of how it can mimic human creativity, it can impose upon human creativity uh, when it is unbridled and unchecked, especially as it continues to learn and grow. Yeah, yeah the, the thing that I think about the, the space is, uh, is the game theory and game space as, a, as somewhere where I think we're gonna see uh, challenges, but also some things we've never seen before. So uh, let's see, IBM and AI beating chess in 96, and then Alpha Go beating that in 2017. Mm -hmm. The thing I think about is, and this is the second thing that hit me about AI at South by Southwest, is I went to a panel with some of the developers around that, and there's a documentary, you can watch this, but like, when Alpha Go, so Go is the most complex human game, right? So, they, so Google's DeepMind built a system to play uh, the best player in the world. And in that process, I think it was in game three, they played five games. The AI made a move and all the commentators and all the experts, start, they started laughing. They're like, it made a mistake. And the AI researchers are running around like, what happened? And, and then they realized that what had happened was the system made a creative move that has never been thought of before from a human. And it solved the game in a way that nobody had ever seen. And so then you have commentators using words like this beautiful and it's a transcendental process and we've never, and it changed the game. And if I could add one more, like just recently with poker, the game of poker was changed by AI, right? The, the team out of CMU that, that built that system, it completely changed the way the top poker players are playing because it played so well. Mm -hmm. And there are others like diplomacy and other games. But I'm curious, like in the music space, when an AI system, the panel that I went to with you all, somebody was kind of mocking, like that's never gonna happen, but I'm like, well, you know, if, game, if it can happen in gaming, it could happen, like a song could be as good as a human. I'm curious, like, what do you think that does to the way we understand music and creation? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think AI is capable right now. I mean, there's also levels of human creativity sure, and people's sure. ability to make music. There's AI right now that makes music that's better than, subjectively, I guess, better than what some people can make, right? It just depends upon what your threshold of success is. So, and it will be that way. So there will be, you know, in the next five to 10 years, a button you can press that's not making some MIDI orchestration of music. It's actually 
doing a reverse diffusion thing where it's sculpting songs out of noise effectively and making legit sounding tracks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the repercussions of that are. I mean, the way that I think about it is there's two things I would say to this. Like, first of all, if everyone can make music, if everyone you can pull out your phone and hit a button and make your favorite a song in the style of your favorite artist, right? Who then is your favorite artist? Like, who? What do you? What genres of music do you seek out when music is so democratized that we can all make stuff that sounds the same, right? I, the kind of glass half full side of me thinks that we'll get back to some more experimental, some more outside the box thinking, which is not what pop music typically is or popular music typically is, mm -hmm. whether that's jazz or it's pr progressive rock or whatever we get into, something that that you know maybe it'll help us evolve a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, is creators, and the other thing is that maybe it will get us back to appreciating things like live performance more, right? Where people know, if you don't know if something's AI or it's real or whatever, and those could end up being two genres of music, by the way, AI and organic, um, you wanna see more of the actual creative component. Whether it's somebody performing live, you wanna go see somebody craft a song or what have you. There could be new opportunities for artists as they kind of expose their workflow and expose the humanity of what they're doing as opposed to AI. I was just having a vision of a record store, like a grocery store, like the organic section of vinyl. I love it. The, the rest, yeah. <laughs> Danny, anything else on, on that in terms of like the creative, what that does in terms of what yeah. the doors open to creation? I agree with what Daniel was saying in probably there being a swing back to novelty mm -hmm. and one thing that I think that we always have to remember is whatever AI exists, it was written by a human and it was trained upon things that humans invented. So whatever the output is, it is going to be based on creative choices that humans made and humans built. So ultimately it will, uh, one of the one of the bad outcomes I think that you were alluding to is that things will become like very mid, right? Like if AI is generating the the bulk of music, then everything will sort of even out and sound mediocre. Um, but that's where novelty comes into play, and that's where uh, what you were alluding to with AlphaGo and that algorithm comes into play. The the ability to make lateral choices. And what's actually really interesting about the AlphaGo thing is that that algorithm was trained upon a decision tree, which basically means, okay, for every choice that I make, here are the two or the four other choices I can make, and then from there, here's the eight more that I can make. Uh, so it, the humans interpreted that as it making a creative choice, mm -hmm. but it was actually just thinking many steps ahead in a way that most humans were not. Mm -hmm. It was still operating under a structure, right? So that is still where I think humans have an advantage is we're able to jump from here all the way to here without there being a connection in between and then we can make that connection. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. So as you think about, I mean, it's funny, I was thinking about like the cycles of the music industry and uh, I went to the session with Will Page, who's like the former chief economist of Spotify and he was like, you know, as soon as you figure out the music industry is, it's too late. Like it's already moving on to the next thing. So as you look out in your spaces, where do you see, see things going in terms of economic, economic opportunities, development opportunities, both for artists as well as for, let's say, copyright holders, copyright owners like labels and publishers? I, well, from, from a, a grassroots creator perspective, there are more opportunities than ever. And that applies not only to the people here in this room, but to people in Nambia, to people in the Philippines, um, to people in rural towns all across the world. We're seeing folks be able to mobilize and be able to create community no matter where they are in the world. And we're, we're seeing the rise of local markets in a way that has never happened before. And that really is the result of a way in the way that we consume. So a generation, two generations ago, we were all consuming through broadcasting. So you would turn on the TV, you turn on the radio, you would consume what millions of other people were consuming at the same time. And with the rise of social media, that completely flipped to narrow casting, which means that what you're seeing is different from what you're seeing, which is different from what you're seeing every time you open your phone. And that has allowed the proliferation of 
amazing small communities, smaller artists, smaller sounds, new sounds to pop up all over the world and to have the opportunity to shine and to thrive and to have careers in a way that we frankly never had before. Yeah, so to go in a different direction that as far as opportunities for artists, for labels and things like that, I mean, labels are very interested right now in the functional music side of things, or in the adaptive music, I should say, side of things, where we can, you know, okay, I said earlier, right, we have these AI source separation tools which are getting better, which means I can take your song and I can separate it into vocals and drums and bass and all of that stuff. Well, then what do you do with that, right? The ability to then adapt that music to a gaming experience is an example, where the music is responsive to what you're doing in the game, and that's in a semi-automated way without having to have a producer come in and kind of customize that. They find that very interesting. Or with Endel, who we were talking about earlier, who'll take an artist's existing music and turn it into kind of like meditative yoga mu music, right? And that's another avenue for the artist to monetize an existing creation. And I think we're gonna continue to see that sort of thing, is how much mileage, right now, I mean, you make a song, you just kind of throw it out there and you make another song, right? That can only continue, that's a treadmill like you know, the, uh, the content treadmill for Instagram or anything like that, that's not something that's sustainable for an artist, right? And it really devalues, I think, the art itself, right? So what can we do to get more value out of the, the music that we create? Mm -hmm. And AI, I think, is becoming a you know, part of that as well. And the other thing, lastly, I'll say is you, we're gonna see the rise, continued rise of virtual idols, I think. Mm -hmm. We're gonna start to see, finally, uh, in the West, for better or worse, more artists that don't exist Right, so that that are digital representations of artists. Their voices may or may not be sung by a human. It may be something that is that's, that's voice synthesis, and AI may be involved in the creation of the music. I mean, that's happened for a long time in other places, as I've said before, and it's a, it's becoming a big thing here. We, I mean, we're used to things like, you know, bands like Gorillas and things like that, right? Who have avatar representations of themselves as a band. But this is another direction where it's literal, you know, hologram performances of artists that do not exist at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting what Disney's been doing it forever. I mean, it's yeah. what, you know, all these animated characters. So I master a lot of the music for Disney and it's like they don't really exist, but they're very popular and they sell lots of albums. Do you also along with that think that like what ABBA did with basically having themselves in a certain era yeah. that that's going to be kind of wholesale cross catalog for artists? I mean, it's another way if a label can if you can monetize the IP, it's going to get yeah. monetized. Yeah. I, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. Do you want to share a little bit of what what ABBA did? I'll let you share. Yeah. So they basically, in one era, de developed uh, with a team virtual repre representations of themselves. In they built a theater, I think it was in London for that yeah. particular performance. But they had a whole like immersive audio component. But they captured that era, and that's how they did the performances. Yeah, but they did like all motion capture stuff. Yeah. yeah, which is super cool. And we've seen exa you know examples of like hologram tours with you know Zappa yeah. and Tupac yeah. and all this stuff before. But this was kind of on a completely other level. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Again, it lets artists kind of engage with their fans in new and interesting ways. In this case, even from a period that they, they, there's no way they could do this uh, yeah. outside of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to take questions. So if you are on the app, you can throw questions there. I left my screen over there, which I'm going to get in a second. But I want to throw one more question to you all, and that is students, folks in the room here, um, just entering the industry, what would you recommend they start doing now in terms of this tech to start preparing for the, the way the industry is changing? Yeah, so I would probably recommend, there's not, I don't know if I would recommend that you deep dive music AI, right? I mean, I think it's something interesting and I think it's certainly evolving and I, it's probably more important to deep dive things like ChatGPT. Um, that is, I think, for no matter what you're gonna do in your career, I don't care if it's in music, outside of music, as an artist, as a whatever, that, especially with some of the updates in the past month for that technology, where it can now kind of reach out and control other pieces of software, is going to be an absolutely crucial part of you being successful. I, I, I honestly believe that. Whether you're working for a company or like, I, like me, working for myself, right, and needing to automate processes so I can do more of the stuff that I like, I think that's a big deal. Yeah. I think no matter what, as a creative, you have to be adaptive and responsive and that applies to almost everything that you do, and that certainly applies with AI. I think that so long as you're open and curious and willing to experiment with the tools and to know what is available and out there and be able to see what enhances your process and maybe what you feel you can discard because it devalues it, at least put your toes in the water and figure out what exists because 
I think other people on the stage mentioned it, uh, everyone is going to be using this at some point. So don't get left in the dust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna step back what I just said because I do, th it is important for you to, to kind of keep abreast of what's out there. It doesn't mean you have to use it, right? So I, I think the, the danger from whether you're kind of an aspiring creative uh, or, you know, to making a career out of or you're established is to put your head in the sand and just be like, I'm just going to do it the way that's always been done. There's a vibe to that and it's cool, but ultimately you may pull your head out of the sand one day and, you know, be left in the dust a little bit when there is valuable technology out there that can kind of, again, make you more efficient, take you in directions you never, again, that's the best thing for AI to me is taking you in directions you never thought you could go. So why not open yourself up to something that could make you you know, have a, have a wider sonic palette. I don't, I don't see a downside to that. All right, first question. We kind of hit this a little bit, but maybe you can drill down a little deeper. What concerns do you have for copyright claims if an AI added creation accidentally creates duplicative or yeah. deri a derivative work? Yeah, that's a really interesting and specific one because the, the only way that this would ever matter, matter from a legal perspective. Actually, who submitted that question? Just so I can answer it. Hi, in the back. Um, so if, if a, a song was released that was the output of an AI and it sounded just like a Dua Lipa song, um, I'm say Dua Lipa because only A tier artists would likely have the time and the resources, the money to go after something like this. Uh, they would have to um, sue, go to court, and then 50-50, the company might be able to claim that it is a proprietary technology and they don't have to divulge what is under the hood. Um, or depending on how things go, they might have to reverse engineer or expose what it was trained on. Uh, what will more likely happen nine times out of 10 is that things will sound in the vein of, but not close enough to an existing recording for an A-list artist to want to uh, spend the money to go to court over it. Yeah, and I mean, AI t is terrible about this even right now, right? Especially lyric generators. Actually, on the panel at South by Southwest, I think uh, the host had used, I think it was ChatGPT, but it could have been anything, to help write lyrics in the style of a specific artist, right? Um, it was act who, it was Lou Reed. Lou Reed. Lou Reed. So he asked, write, write, write me a song in the style of Lou Reed. So, okay, it goes out there and it, you know, kind of examines Lou Reed's style and it writes a song that's effectively Walk on the Wild Side, including the lyrics Walk on the Wild Side, which is Lou Reed's biggest hit. So clearly that's not okay, right? right. So like everything with AI, you can't necessarily just trust what it gives you as A, gospel truth, or B, something that is not directly ripped off from somebody else and is going to get you in trouble, right? So... Yeah. That's another thing where your ear and your understanding, whether you're using it to write papers for school or you're using it to create music with, you still need to know a little bit about what's going on so that you know what to, you know how to filter and refine it. Also, please do not use chat GPT to generate lyrics because you are more than likely going to run into a scenario where you could have derivative content and you don't know it because it is trained on what it can scrape from the web. Yep, you could also ask ChatGPT if what it created is derivative content, and it will Do actually try to it? tell you. I know, but then you have to trust that. I don't know. It's such a <laughs> um, Okay, we see AI voices of celebrities on TikTok already. Do you think artists will be able to completely use AI for song generation eventually? Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a good one. So, um, for. Uh, posthumous releases, sometimes we see these projects half finished, so Mac Miller is an example. Do you see possibly this shaping out by AI? And let me just add one thing. I did see this already happen with classical music. It was not uh, Mozart, but another composer had a section unfinished that another composer had finished. They let AI finished it as a comparison. So in the pop space or other space? Yeah, well this is being done with, like Juice World is an example, right? So there's a whole thing, there's a whole community that is generating finishing off demo tapes effectively for that artist, right? So, and then so they've gotten into creating new music and things like that as well. So looking back at, and the labels of course are gonna be are super interested in that, but fans are doing that to kind of keep, you know, the music that they love going, you know, beyond the artist being able yeah. to do that. It'll just have to be something that we consider with contracts going forward and <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> with this, the estates that, that handle these contracts uh, going forward, yep. um, a consideration that um, we'll have to think about and um, hopefully exclude from the 360 contract. Yeah, for real. How do you think AI changes music-related press? 
music related press thought on that i mean out i'm sure there's a million ways that i'm not aware of but i mean a lot of what you read in press is going to be chat gpt generated yeah. so there's that for sure right that's already a thing um yeah i don't know that's less my world okay um, all right, do you think DAWs will create rich APIs to integrate with AI tools, I hope so. or will this require a VST AU on each mixable element? Will new DAWs be required? Yeah, so it's interesting. That's a good question. There's, a, there's some new DAWs being made right now that are AI-powered DAWs like natively, meaning they were built from the ground up to be that. And this, is, this is relates to something we chatted about earlier. It's one thing to kind of tack AI on to something that has an existing massive code base that you know moves glacially as far as updates and all of that. It's another thing to build something you know that that it focuses on that from the point of creation. So like never before heard sounds is about to release a DAW uh, that's fully AI empowered, right? So it's what I think is going to happen is you're going to see yes VSTs and plugins that exist now, right? We'll continue continue to see a proliferation of that. But there's only so far that those plugins can go as far as the way they communicate with the DAW. Now that'll continue to evolve, but there is there's blocks there. So I think you know a lot of the major manufacturers are looking at acquisitions around this um, and partnerships where they can do yeah deeper integrations into the into their actual software, and that's where it'll start. Ultimately, I think we are at some point going to see the rise of new DAWs that aren't currently around. Right now, we're kind of oversaturated with them, right? And I've always been like, who the, why did you, a new company will make a DAW, Universal Audio. I'm like, why the hell did you make another one? Like, it, we have enough of these already, right? The, all, they all do the same thing, except they just name things in the menu, you know, different, and there's a little bit different of a workflow. But I changed my thought on that when we get into the AI space. I do think there's a lot that can be done there, and I think a lot of it's going to be done in the browser. It's not, this is not going to be desktop star, stuff that you install. That's going to go, go by the wayside. We're really entering into a new phase of you know, yeah, browser-based DAWs, intelligent at the outset, you know, collaborative, useful for everybody, whether you have a Chromebook or you have a pimped-out Mac. Um, it really kind of opens up that world. Thanks for the band lab description. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, little, I'm a little biased, but also I think that a lot of us do believe that there is an oversaturation of DAWs in the market, but I, I personally don't believe that. I think there's an oversaturation of DAWs that do the same thing. That's what I meant. Yeah, in the market. And we're, I, don't, I don't know about the DAW that you said that's going to be coming out, but there is definitely space for people to rethink what a DAW is and to completely upend workflows and to think about uh, the next generation of producers and how they're natively using the tools that they have in the palm of their hand every day, um, and as opposed to downloading big clunky piece of software that they use on a desktop. I mean, I'm I'm guilty of that. I'm I'm an Ableton user. I love it. Um, but there there's there's room to circumvent the the ways that we currently expect to do work and to do it differently. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say on that is. We are still in this phase of creating digital tools that just emulate stuff in the analog world that aren't natively digital, right? So like you go to a DAW and it's a mixer, right? And you, one screen is a mixer, one screen is a multi-track tape recorder effectively, right? With a bunch of cool stuff wrapped around it. But that's, was it, that was brought about just because that was the workflow in the analog world, right? So I'm a co-founder of a company in Germany that makes a browser-based DAW that we're trying to eschew a lot of that and make something that's natively, you can do anything, right? So why? like tie yourself down to doing things that are you know that were that are they're that just traditionally the way that we work great that's awesome and there's a place for that stuff but i think there's also new ground that can be broken with ux and ui incorporating gamification incorporating things that we've learned from other uh yeah other arenas and making something cool yeah we're more creative than reskinning plugins oh <laughs> right <Yes. laughs> i don't need another compressor that looks like an analog compressor in my computer what the hell is the point of that like <laughs> All right, well, we are, we are unfortunately out of time. I would encourage you, if you have other questions to ask, um, our guests will be at the uh, party tonight and will be around, so please uh, connect with them. But Danny Deal, Daniel Rowland, thank you so much. Round of applause.